Just over there is Bardsey Island. It's a stunning wind-blasted rock two miles off the coast of northwest Wales. And I first came here when I was 16. It's one of my favourite places on Earth. It can be difficult to get to. It can be cut off from the mainland for up to weeks at a time. Journeys to remote locations like Bardsey are central to Welsh art in the 20th century. It was an era when artists pushed to the extremes, redefining where you could work and what you could make art about. It's the story of how artists explored what it meant to be Welsh, how they dug deep into the country's landscape and history to portray Wales in totally new ways. It's about breaking boundaries and turning the idea of what art can be on its head. It's also a tale of surprises and some breathtakingly good work. I'm Hugh Stevens, a radio presenter from Cardiff. I grew up in Wales, surrounded by the music, literature and language that the country is famous for. But one thing we've tended not to shout about in Wales is our art. In fact, it's been something of a missing piece in the culture, not just of Wales, but all of Britain. In this series, I'm going in search of the hidden treasures of Welsh art. It's a story of national pride, creativity and inspiration. The turn of the 20th century saw a revolution in the world of art. All across Europe, artists were challenging the academic traditions, experimenting with different styles to create something completely new. Paintings no longer needed to look realistic. Colours were exaggerated. Shapes became more abstract. Artists competed with each other to shock. Two young Welsh painters were at the forefront of this artistic upheaval, and they must have looked quite the sight, arriving here in the sleepy corner of Snowdonia in 1911, with brightly coloured clothes, floppy hats, wives, girlfriends, and children in tow. Their names were Augustus John and James Dixon Innes. They became obsessed with this place, Arenig Vaur, and fell under the spell of the mountain. For the next 18 months, they made a series of extraordinary paintings that still dazzle over a hundred years later. Augustus John was already famous. His outrageous behaviour and brooding good looks gave him almost rock star status. But in Paris, he'd met the young Picasso and immersed himself in the latest artistic ideas. James Dixon Innes was only 24 years old when he arrived at Arenig. He'd also been to France, where his work had been transformed by the colours he found there. Artist Keith Bowen paints the landscape around Arenig Vaud and is fascinated by Augustus John and Dixon Innes and what they created here. Innes had long talked about a Wild Wales tour and that's what brought him here. An artist has to find something that he can talk about and use and talk with. And when he saw this side of the mountain, this was the key that he was looking for. When Augustus came, he said, I have found some miraculous promised land. I feel full of work. So would the both of them have been working side by side here, looking at the mountain? Absolutely. That's wow. what they did. You can look at different pictures of the same view and you can imagine the easels would have been next to each other. Innes was very much the junior. He was nine years younger than John, but he had an intensity of emotion. 
that Augustus saw as being unique. So how revolutionary were the paintings for the time? We are not talking about the greys and the subtlety of the mists of Turner. We are talking about stained glass brilliance. And yet they did so much, but they were only here for around 18 months. Innes, he had TB. He knew that the days were numbered. The paintings he did, the intensity of Innes's vision were almost like a volcano. The cloud formations were like the mountain was on fire. The man was in a hurry. Right. It was speed painting. Because he knew he was going to die. Yes. What are the reputations of the artist and the paintings now, Keith? They reflect what the thought was at the start of the 20th century, which was the greatest change in painting. They brought an emotion, a sensitivity, and they brought it here to the middle of what some people regard as nowhere, but I think is absolutely the centre. And today, as we look back towards them, we see what great artists they were. Augustus said of Innes, a renig vower for Innes was his sacred mountain, and the mignite, the moor that he walked across, was forever his spiritual home. But it wasn't to last, and Dixon Innes died of TB, aged just 27, in August 1914, just as the First World War started. His work here lives on, of course, and if anything, has gained popularity in recent years. Now, when you look at Renig Vaur, even on a wet and windy day like today, it's hard not to see the mountain through Dixon Innes's eyes. Augustus John went on to become one of Britain's best-known artists, but he never worked with this sort of freedom again and never returned to Wales to paint. Despite his huge fame, in 1942, he made an extraordinary prediction. He said, in 50 years' time, I'll be known as the brother of Gwen John. And he was right. Gwen and Augustus John were brought up in the small seaside town of Tenby. But they couldn't have been more different. If Augustus was loud and extrovert, Gwen was quiet and intense. That's not to say that Gwen John wasn't just as strong a character. Look at this self-portrait from 1900. This is a determined young woman, hand on hip, glaring out of the canvas, no messing. She was just 24. The National Museum of Wales in Cardiff holds the largest collection of Gwen John's work in the world. Alicia Foster has written extensively about the artist. Gwen John struck out on her own. She decided to forge her own artistic path, and that takes her to Paris, of course, which is where all young modernists wanted to go in the late 19th, early 20th century. She met the world-famous sculptor Rodin, of course, and became his lover and model, didn't she? That, again, is fascinating, because to go to Paris in 1904 and take your clothes off in the studio of the most famous sculptor in the world, I mean, that is not somebody who is reticent or lacks self-belief or is shy <laughs> about the world. So when we think about an interior like this, I think we need to remember that it's an interior painted in Paris by somebody who was very much part of artistic circles and not withdrawn from them. It is a stunning painting. I find it very calming, Alicia, that light is very important, is it? Light and light to kind of create space. At the same time, allied to that, you've got this wonderful sense of tone. I would say the nearest equivalent is to poetry, in that she works with very condensed means to produce these huge effects. Augustus very early on said, um, my sister has, to Whistler, in fact, said to Whistler, my sister has a fine appreciation of character. And Whistler apparently said, no, it's tone your sister understands, it's tone. We have another Gwen John here, and this one is from uh, a few years later, is it? Yes, this is around 1914 to 15, we think, around the time the First World War has just started. 
She condenses everything she knows. She absolutely edits out anything that's extraneous. And if you think about the control that's necessary to create that effect with such pared down means, with such restraint, I mean, this is somebody at the top of her artistic game, I think. So her brother Augustus was one of Britain's most famous artists. Was she in any way overshadowed by him, do you think? I think she made sure she wasn't. By the 1920s in Paris, it's reported that everyone knows Gwen John's name. She sells whatever she shows. And by 1930, when she's 54, her work has already entered a number of major international museums. This is someone whose reputation is established by the time of her death. In the grand scheme of things, where would you place Gwen John in the story of 20th century art? Without doubt, I'd say she's one of the greatest British artists of the 20th century, and of course, one of the greatest Welsh artists. In the museum's conservation studio, you can see exactly how Gwen John worked. So, Adam, what do we have here? Here is an unfinished oil painting by Gwen John. Wow. So I think what strikes me is it's a very controlled way of painting. To actually paint like this without completing areas, you know, in the whole composition is quite a difficult way to work. And Adam, there's a surprise to this painting, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> People, we've been surprised to see the back of this. OK. It's an unfinished nude. It's very unusual that the face hasn't been finished, isn't it? It's not the likeness that's important here. The facial features are important, but it's not about necessarily this individual sitter. Yeah. It's about the body and the space and the structure of the form. It's a window into her way of working, mm. and we get to see just how little the face was important mm. at this stage mm. to her. It's amazing to think that this was painted 100 years ago. Mm unfinished. It's like she's just painted it and walked out the studio, isn't mm. it? Out onto mm. the Parisian streets. Mm. The period before the First World War was an exciting time, with Welsh artists working in radically different ways. Some, like Augustus John and Dixon Innes, were self-consciously modern, looking to Europe for inspiration. But others took a different route, delving deep into Welsh history and mythology, and especially into the classics of medieval literature like the Mabinogi and the Book of Taliesin. I grew up with these fantastic stories, the stunning landscapes, the weird magic, the sort of part of my Welsh cultural DNA, if you like. But at the beginning of the 20th century, they'd only recently been rediscovered, and their effect on one artist in particular was dramatic. That artist was Christopher Williams. In 1904, he came to Carnarvon Castle to take part in the Pan-Celtic Congress, a gathering of artists and writers from Wales, Scotland and Ireland. The Congress was something of an epiphany for Williams. It was the moment he discovered traditional Celtic tales and traditional Welsh music. You can see him here in this brilliant photo from the 1904 Congress. He's dressed in his bardic robes, looking completely entranced. Williams wrote home to his wife, I have been steeped in Celtic ideals, flooded with early Welsh history and pre-Arthurian tales and mythology. It is a gold mine untouched and full of Welsh fire and imagination. Williams was soon mining this rich seam of subject matter and started with Curridwen, a shape-shifting enchantress from the Mabinogi, who possesses a cauldron of poetic inspiration. When a servant steals some of the potion, she transforms herself into a greyhound, a fish and a hawk to catch him. Williams built a reputation both in Wales and beyond, but he's less known now, and some of his most important paintings can be hard to find. 
1911, he painted the investiture of the new Prince of Wales, the future Edward VIII. Unveiled with great pomp and ceremony at the time, it's now tucked away in a back room at Carnarvon Town Council offices. And just down the corridor is one of Williams' key paintings. He made it at the same time as he was working on the Royal Commission, but it's a portrait of a very different Welsh royal. This is Christopher Williams' vision of his country reborn. It's called Defroad Cymru, Wales Awakening, and it shows Gwen Llian, the daughter of Llewellyn, the last native Prince of Wales. Gwen Llian was locked up in an English convent so that there wouldn't be a line of succession. But according to legend, she didn't die there. She was just sleeping, lying in wait for a Welsh revival. And that's what Williams is depicting here, with Gwen Llian rising up over the dragon, bathed in white light, suggesting a new dawn, a moment of reawakening for Wales. Sad to see it tucked away here, really, but maybe, like Gwen Xi'an, the painting is just biding its time, waiting for its big moment. Christopher Williams' dream of a new Wales based on the arts was wrecked by the First World War. His friend, David Lloyd George, became Britain's wartime prime minister, and in 1916, he commissioned Williams to commemorate the Battle of Mamet's Wood in the Somme, where thousands of Welsh troops died, taking a small, heavily defended patch of woodland. The painting used to hang in Downing Street, but it's no jingoistic celebration. Instead, it's full of Williams' despair at the suffering brought on by the war. After the war, Lloyd George promised a land fit for heroes, but returning soldiers faced an economic slump and unemployment. One artist who noticed the stark reality of what was happening around him decided to portray it in paint. His name was Evan Walters, and he came from here, in Swansea. This is Swansea College of Art. There have been art schools in Wales since the 1850s, but this place was different because it actively sought students from working class backgrounds. So carpenters, electricians, miners, everybody was welcome, as long as you could draw or paint. In the 1920s, Swansea was a hotbed for the arts, and at its heart was an extraordinary patron who helped forge the careers of many young Welsh artists. Her name was Winifred Coombe Tennant. The first of the young Swansea artists that Winifred Coombe Tennant talent spotted was the son of a local pub owner, Evan Walters. In 1920, she commissioned this portrait of her and her two young sons, and it led Walters to many more commissions. It's a fantastic piece of work and so vibrant, but it was the looming industrial catastrophe that led Walters to his most memorable and important painting. The crisis in industrial South Wales came to a head in May 1926, when colliery owners threatened to cut miners' wages. A general strike across Britain was called in support of the miners, but it lasted only nine days. In South Wales, the striking miners stayed out for months before being forced back on lower wages. There are few images of the strike, apart from photographs and grainy newsreels, but Evan Walters created one compelling painting. This is William Hopkins, a miner and a friend of Walters. This portrait, made in 1926, means that Hopkins would have been in the middle of the lockout, his pinched, pained expression speaking on behalf of his fellow strikers. Walters gives the miner great dignity 
but doesn't try to hide the fact that he's struggling. The painting was shown in London to raise funds and awareness about the plight of the miners. It's an incredibly rare picture of working class life at the time, and it deserves to be much better known. Walters made another painting in that angry summer of 1926. Welsh Funeral Hymn is a complex allegorical painting filled with despair about the situation in the coal mining valleys. Bydd Mildo Rhyfeddoda is, to me, the most remarkable painting of the first half of the 20th century in Wales. It stands out for all sorts of reasons. We have Evan Walter's own description of it in the letter that he wrote to Winifred Coombe Tennant, who was obviously very confused by the picture. And Walters describes the elements in it and the young, the boys, as he says, in the foreground who carry the stigmata, they obviously represent the idea of wasted youth in the period and the social trauma of the period and their sacrifice, the notion of sacrifice. In the background, we've got um, the choir singing in front of the nonconformist chapel and Walters in his letter describes it all as, uh, as dismal and dark and in the minor key. So it's a lament, if you like. And what's so special about him for me is his ability to bring this big, huge international high art tradition and what's intensely specific to us in Wales. By the 1930s, the industrial heartland of South Wales was left devastated by the Depression, with families and entire communities living in poverty and struggling to survive. Seeing this, some artists decided to get involved, and one did so more than others. His name was Cedric Morris. He had quite an unusual background for a Welsh artist. He wasn't a working class man, was he? No, he came from a rich industrial family. He was born in Sketty near Swansea. He left school quite early. He travelled to Canada, worked on a farm, um, worked as a dishwasher in New York, and then came back to Wales. So he never really had any formal training as an artist. He was largely self-taught, and you can see that in his painting, in the directness of his work. I love the colours that he's using. I don't know, there's something really vibrant about this painting. Lots of people have pointed out the influence of J.D. Innes on his work, so he may be someone that Morris was familiar with and been influenced by at that time. When this portrait was painted, he just met his um, life partner, Arthur Lett Haynes. Himself and Lett were completely open about their sexuality. He was someone that could go across different social classes and bring people together. That was part of the, the kind of environment they created, a very tolerant, open environment where people could be themselves. So he was a visionary, really. And he's got the reputation as one of the most important and greatest colorists in British art. So there's the man himself, and we have one of his works here, a beautiful piece. Um, another Welsh landscape of Cedric Morris, which he was quite well known for. So here in this landscape, we're in the village of Penclough, and we're looking across the Locker Estuary towards this industrial area. And what's really interesting with Morris is that he's combining the natural landscape of Wales with the industrial landscape. And I think in that way, he differs from other artists, particularly artists that didn't know Wales so well and often came into Wales to paint the romantic, beautiful landscapes, who often overlooked the industrial heritage of Wales. But Morris had connections with place and connections with people, so those communities were incredibly important for him. And those working class communities and the poverty within them had a profound effect on him, didn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Bearing in mind this is the 1930s, so we're at the height of depression, so unemployment rates in the steel industry and in coal mining are very, very high. And Morris was visiting these areas, he was meeting people, he was meeting politicians, and he was trying to make a real contribution to improving society for people. One of the things that he did was that he would go into the valleys and he'd work and teach in educational settlements in places like Dowlais and Pontypridd, a kind of precursor, if you like, of socially engaged art, the sense that art can make life and society better 
And I think one of the reasons that Morris was so motivated in this way is that he had this deep connection to Wales and he understood these communities. The most experimental Welsh artist of the 1930s was another working class graduate of Swansea School of Art. Kerry Richards had trained first as an electrician, but was transformed by seeing an extraordinary collection of Impressionist paintings. And he didn't see them in Paris or London, but at a private house near Newtown. This is Grigunog Hall in mid Wales, once owned by the fabulously rich granddaughters of a Victorian coal baron, Margaret and Gwendolyn Davis. The sisters visited Paris before the First World War where they indulged their passion for art and became known as sophisticated collectors with a penchant for the then radical works by the likes of Monet, Cezanne, Renoir and Van Gogh. These were the paintings that so transfixed Kerry Richards, and now they hang in the National Museum of Wales in Cardiff. But in the 1920s, they were here at Grigunog, the centrepiece of what the sisters planned as a national education centre for the arts. Kerry Richards was just 20 when he first came here to see the Sisters collection in 1923, and it must have been a mind-blowing experience for him. Walking into this grand old country house and seeing some of the work of the finest artists in the world right in front of his very eyes. And some 40 years later, it was still a very vivid memory for him. When I was in, in Swansea School of Art, uh, there was a, a summer school held in the Grigunog Hall, run by Mrs. Davis's, a mother and two daughters of Shandina, and they had assembled part of their collection which contained the Impressionists. The world, I thought, was a fixed, static thing. But I mean, all the interpretations were very different. So that uh, 50 artists would produce 50 reactions to the same sort of situation. A decade after his epiphany at Grigunog, Kerry Richards was at the cutting edge of European art. Brian, it's a huge jump, isn't it, going from Grigunog being inspired by Renoir and Monet to then creating these pieces ten years later. And it's most unusual, isn't it? Well, yes, it is, and it was actually pretty unusual for the time as well. All through his studies in the 1920s, Richards had been absorbing the influence of modernism, and these relief constructions are really basically the kind of the outcome of that. This one's called Man with a Pipe. I'm trying to figure out where the man and the pipe are, Brian. <laughs> well, if we just go and have a look at it. So here is the man's head. He's got his eyes. And his nose is created by this big void in the centre here. Then his mouth is represented by this circle here with a little moustache. Uh, the pipe is there in this wooden piece. It's viewed from above, you can see, and he's holding it with his arm. And he's sitting on this chair, which Richards has cut out from paper and stuck on, and then he's got his legs here. And the lovely thing is, is that he's also potentially reading a newspaper, which is done through actual newsprint itself. OK. How cutting edge was this at the time? Throughout the 20s and even into the 30s, art in Britain was still quite figurative, and so something like this would have been really quite radical. During the Second World War, Richards was back in Wales, working on a government art scheme. So, Bryony, what do we have here? Um, here we have works which Richards made during the Second World War. They're a series of watercolours which were commissioned by the Ministry of Information. One of the key things which the Commission wanted artists such as Richards to try and communicate was the types of industrial labour that were happening on the home front and were helping with the war effort. Richards basically chose to illustrate the tin plate works at Gowerton, which obviously had very personal significance for him because that was where his father had worked for most of his life. 
So what's happening here then? This is uh, it's just a dark picture, isn't it? It is. I mean, it's an extremely dramatic image, and this is one of the things which Richard was clearly trying to convey, like the sense of what it was like to actually be in that tin plate works at that time. So he brought a lot of different cultures and art forms into his work. His work was essentially a fusion of kind of art, music and poetry. That was what he was striving for, for his entire career. And he did it in such a beautiful, lyrical, evocative way. Yeah. And it really, really makes his work something quite special, I think. While Kerry Richards was being inspired by modern European art, another group of artists were exploring the landscape and culture of their own country. Their mission took them into the Welsh heartlands, where they learned the language, the traditions and the way of life. Later, they'd be called Welsh environmentalists, but it was much more than recording and observing a way of life. It was about being part of a place. One of the early pioneers was Brenda Chamberlain. In 1935, Chamberlain settled in the village of Llanllechid on the edge of Snowdonia, where, with her husband, John Petts, she set up the Cassegg Press. They produced hand-printed broadsheets, illustrating poems from the best young Welsh writers. The musician Griff Rees, best known for super furry animals, comes from the same village. Before music, he went to art college and is a big fan of her work. This is Brenda's self-portrait from 1938 then, Griff, when she was living in San Llechid. Yeah, it looks like a selfie. <laughs> it's the same dimensions. Um, and maybe it's a way of judging a character. There's no um, peace signs or, <laughs> or heroic poses. Yeah. She was considered to be the first hippie in the area in the 1930s. She'd have come back from London to North Wales and she was known for adapting flower sacks as proto mini dresses she'd wear around the village. I hadn't seen these broadsheets till recently, Griffin. They're very intricate, aren't they? But they're very small, aren't they? They're delicate things. Yeah, it's the first time I've ever seen them in the flesh. But they are things that can be passed around easily, I suppose, and posted. Yeah, yeah. And um, distributed to the working people. Yeah. But they obviously had a real understanding and love of words and of design. And I mean, there's poetry by Dylan Thomas and Brenda's own artwork as well. And they all come together in these beautifully, don't they? Yeah. Well, and she left the world with beautiful objects. The books and the paintings and the prints of. of they're figurative works, but they're very expressive, and her life and her art are completely intertwined. At the end of the Second World War, Brenda Chamberlain divorced. Depressed and unable to work, she headed for an even more remote location and began one of the most remarkable journeys in Welsh art. In Welsh, Bardsey Island is Ynys Enlli, and it's been a pilgrimage site since the 6th century. It's said to be the island of 20,000 saints. When Brenda Chamberlain came here in 1947, it was home to a few fishermen and farmers. In her book, Tide Race, she described her arrival on the island. I have found the home of my heart. I could not eat, I could not think straight. So I came to this solitary place and lay in the sun. The island wore a deceptive summer innocence, like a flower garden in which a serpent lay asleep. Brenda Chamberlain lived on Bardsey for 15 years, painting the landscape and the islanders. I first came to Unessentially when I was 16 to volunteer for the week. And I stayed here at Carreg, Brenda Chamberlain's house. It's got incredible paintings of hers all over the walls upstairs. They were quite faded back then, but I believe they've been restored. So I'm looking forward to seeing them again. Ah, and here it is. Oh, it's 
so much clearer now than it was, now that it's been restored. And a glass over it as well, giving it the respect that it deserves. That was brilliant to see it again. There's another horse here. And I love the simplicity of Chamberlain's work. Apparently she painted these on a whim around the house, like the house is a giant sketchbook. Here, you can make out the figures, the children, fishing nets. They must be down on the beach here on Badzi. see how badly influenced Brenda Chamberlain's work. It's a hard place to live, but absolutely stunning. And that's what I love about her work, is that it does bring the island alive through her story and through the painting stories. So much more than, say, a photograph. While Brenda Chamberlain was making Bardsey her own artistic universe, another artist was beginning his journey into the wild extremes of the Welsh landscape. In the process, he became the most popular Welsh artist of the 20th century. Cuffin Williams painted the stunning mountains of North Wales for almost 60 years, developing his own distinctive style. He very early on found that rather than the brush, it was the painting knife which he felt could help him um, capture what he called the solidity of the mountains. And using it in a way which very early on points the way to the future. At one time, I always put the figures of farmers and their dogs in the landscape. But the longer I painted in the mountains, somehow I, I got a greater feeling of immensity. And with that feeling of immensity, the farmers, the dogs, the people, they had no part. In this way, I suppose my pictures became more abstract. Frequently filmed for television, Cuffin Williams cultivated the image of a wily countryman. But it wasn't just an act. He knew the landscape like the back of his hand. Some attribute Cuffin's success to a form of nostalgia for a simpler, pre-industrial way of life. But like Brenda Chamberlain and other artists, Cuffin realised that Welsh love of landscape. There's a word in Welsh, hiraith, which loosely translates as a deep longing for home. Maybe that's what Cuffin did. Snowdonia is fundamental. He paints with a passion which is channeling feelings and so the landscape becomes his way of expressing himself. He's essentially an expressionist painter and it's pouring those feelings which have been prompted by the, the magnitude of the mountains, that feeling of being alone in the mountains, of feeling the might of the mountains, the feeling of the individual who is just one small, tiny, tiny figure against the power of nature, the massive, massive landscape. The spectacular scenery of North Wales also inspired a very different artist. This is Blaenau Festiniog, once the hub of the Welsh slate industry. Victorian Britain was built with slate from here, and the town is still surrounded by the grey quarries and spoil tips. In the mid-1960s, the sculptor David Nash moved to Blaenau, buying up an old chapel for just £200. The place has been an inspiration to him for over 50 years now. 
Oh, I have to admit, it was the geography, it was the land, it was the weather and the gales that we'd have. They were the best things. They were, our dustbin would spiral up and all the stuff would fall out of it. It's just fantastic. The chapel is full of David Nash's sculptures. Showing his affinity to one particular material. I have naturally gravitated towards wood. Clay is too soft, hasn't got enough resistance to me. Metal is too, it comes already partly formed because it's made, but wood it grows. It just suits my temperament, which is I wanted to get things done quickly, get an idea, get it done. Stone, very resistant. You need to be a long distance runner to carve stone, and I'm and I'm and I'm a sprinter. The nature of fresh wood is it's full of water, and as it comes out, the wood will inevitably crack. So it not only cracks, it warps. And then as the water comes out, they just move it's from the process of the material. Although David likes to work fast, some of his most renowned art has literally taken decades. His ash dome is a circle of ash trees planted in 1977 and gradually trained to form a canopy. But sadly, in the last few years, it's been hit by ash dieback, the disease that's ravaged ash trees all across Europe. Going back to the original concept is that it grew from natural forces. So unfortunately, a bit like the COVID, it's a natural force. Um, it's a pandemic for ash trees. And I, I, have, to, I have to accept that. I mean, I had hoped it would outlive me. It's another demonstration. We have to do something. We have to change our mentality about how, how we live our lives. You've put so much into here and you've taken here to the world. Do you have a sense of belonging here now? Personally, yes. Every artist has their own story of chances, opportunities. Each artist has their own path. And then Capel Rue came up for sale. I mean, 200 pounds. <laughs> it's a gift, isn't it? I've honored that gift. I've tried to honor it. I, know, I knew it was a gift. Well, that's what I like to think that I've been doing here. Keep it alive. What's here is a congregation. And I make something, it comes in here, and it's a new member. And the others all sort of feel a bit ruffled. <laughs> sort of have to wake up a bit to accommodate this new uh, character. And then they, they go off on church outings <laughs> down to the National Museum in Cardiff. <laughs> now they come back. And when they come back, they're full of the people who've been looking at them. The Wales that David Nash moved into in the 1960s was in turmoil, torn by protest. In 1965, the Trewerin Valley in North Wales was flooded to supply water to Liverpool, and the Welsh language campaign reignited. And this is one of the movement's most famous images, Cofiwch Trewerin, Remember Trewerin. It was painted here by my dad. It's changed a bit over the years. It was vandalised recently, but it's been reinforced. It's looking strong and the paint is fresh. This wall means a lot to the people of Wales. My father, Mick Stevens, wasn't a painter or an artist. He was a writer. And of all the words that he wrote during his lifetime, he says these two, Cofiwch were his most important. 
art in the 1960s was also in turmoil, and a Welsh artist who threw himself into these revolutionary times was Ivor Davis. His work was quite literally explosive. Ivor Davis deliberately created work to be blown up as a protest, both against the art world and the politics of the time. Later, he returned to more traditional art forms, looking at Welsh history and politics. He became part of a group of like-minded artists called Becca, who put the fight for the Welsh language at the heart of their work. Becca is interesting in uh, a Welsh context because really it's, um, I suppose, the first group of artists who got together with a uh, very strong political motivation. They wanted their art to engage with a contemporary Welsh life, not with a mythology about Wales or uh, traditional ideas or the Welsh landscape, but what people were thinking, feeling, and what uh, the politics was, what, what was really concerning people, what was driving the culture. Becca emerged at a time of increased Welsh language activism, which, at its extremes, saw a campaign of burning second homes. Their art was itself controversial. Becca's first exhibition was in 1984 in Bangor. This was one of the paintings that was there, but it achieved instant notoriety because the day after the exhibition opened, uh, the curator uh, of uh, Bangor Museum, as it was then, in his wisdom, took fright and withdrew this painting from the exhibition. He censored it, he took it off the wall because, of course, the subject was very controversial at the time. It shows a, a burning holiday cottage. And this was right bang in the middle of the, of the campaign. And it's got, uh, you know, it's got the Union Jack down there in the corner, symbols of Britishness and so on and so forth. And it's a very, very powerful image. It's a formative period for Wales when, uh, at last, we stood up and, and said, you know, we're here, you know, and we're not going away. Uh, and, and we object to the way we're being treated. And this was part of it. Since the 1990s and the advent of devolution, more political power has moved to Wales, and Welsh culture and visual art have become an important part of how the country presents itself. Painter Shani Rhys-James was part of this new self-confidence. Born in Australia to a Welsh father, she moved to Mid Wales in 1984 and has an international reputation. Her work is deeply personal. She often uses her own face and the rich, highly textured surfaces of the paintings represent her own anxieties. I tend to get a great feeling about what something I want to express and it comes very strongly to me. It's usually something that I feel quite affected by, emotional about. But normally I feel a very strong sense of a painting in me. You said in the past that you want to make people face things that they don't want to face through your work. They're not cosy paintings at all, are they? Truth is really what I'm interested in, something that touches people or that they feel akin to or they feel a sense of empathy with. Often the paintings are, in a way, sort of sweet sadness or sorrow painting my mother, for example, having had a stroke. There is an exquisite beauty in old people, I think, and also people are suddenly without their mask when they are in a vulnerable situation like that. And I think it's without the mask I'm interested in. One of the themes in your work, Shani, is that you appear in a lot of your paintings. Has that always been part of your work? There are ones which are very specifically self-portraits, like the small heads. They are more to do with looking. And that really is a liberation for me, because if I have my own head, it's not that I'm a narcissist, well, probably, probably am a bit, because every artist is a bit, but it's all self-obsessed. It's more to do with the radical things that you can do with your own head. If it's your own head and you're looking at it, it's almost like a landscape. You're disintegrating it into parts with a mirror, so you're looking at it in an objective way. Whereas in the other paintings, it's not necessarily me, it's just because you have no other head and so you, you use it in a, in a sort of imaginative way. How important is it for you to have a reaction to your paintings, Shani? To have an audience. Yeah, it is, it's incredible, it's about communication, really. So that's probably why 
the emotional content is in quite important to me. It's about expressing my feelings, like you as a musician might want to express something about your personal experience. Um, I feel the same, or an actor or writer. To me, that's what's important, really. An audience is important. Where Shani Rees James's studio is, is so beautiful and green, and pleasant and quiet here in Mid Wales. And her studio is so full of colour, bursting, jumping out at you. It's like a, a caffeine shot. And it's given me a whole new appreciation of her work, seeing it so up close and personal, each painting telling a different story. In the 21st century, art in Wales has gone from strength to strength. There's a network of galleries across the country now. And here in Cardiff, the Art is Mundi, which is the biggest art prize of its kind in Britain. For almost 20 years, it's brought some of the most exciting emerging artists to the Welsh capital, with an emphasis on those from Asia and Africa. Today in Wales, the old and the new exist side by side, and some of the most interesting work by Welsh artists bring the two together, taking traditional images and reworking them in surprising ways. One of these artists is Swansea-based Daniel Trivedi. In Welsh Emergency Blanket, Trivedi printed the patterns of traditional Welsh tapestries onto the silver foil space blankets given to refugees rescued from the sea. Just grab it from this side and then we just should be able to turn it over there. Oh, oh wow. wow, look at that. He made the piece in response to the proposal that Wales become a sanctuary for international refugees and it won the main art prize at the National Eisteddfod in 2019. I was thinking a lot about who the work is for, actually. Do I want to make work for an art audience in um, uh, a gallery setting? Or do I want to make work for a wider public? So that's part of the thought process. I found your piece very emotional when I saw it in the East Edward. As a Welsh person with several of these beautiful Welsh blankets at home, it's more than just a blanket, isn't it? Mm. I think lots of families have these blankets and they're being kind of passed down from one generation to another. I always think that objects have a language, they speak to us. When I look at this, it talks to me about heritage, about culture, but it has wider connotations, that of security, of warmth, the warmth we get from heritage and culture. And we can contrast that with the emergency blanket, which is very thin. You couldn't have a thinner blanket. The association with that kind of blanket are ones of people who are fleeing war zones, people who are being persecuted. I think all the best art is quite provocative in the fact that it's so beautiful and, you know, I'm taking pleasure from it, but of course for the purpose of these blankets is to give people comfort in their hour of need. I mean, a lot of this started me going to the refugee camp in Cali. I started speaking to people and then they were telling me their stories. Imagine you've just come off one of those boats or had one of those traumatic journeys and notionally, what does it mean to put that blanket on somebody, yeah? You're not just saying, here's a blanket um, to keep you warm, you're actually saying, we are willing to share our culture with you and think about the wider world and what's going on in it. One artist taking Wales onto the world stage is Bedwyr Williams. He's based near his hometown of Colwyn Bay on the North Wales coast and has built a major international reputation, exhibited at the Venice Biennale and Artis Mundi. Bedwyr uses autobiography, photography and everyday objects in his work, and it's often very funny. For his piece, Walk a Mile in My Shoes, he exhibited 45 pairs of his old shoes, all in a whopping size 13. Visitors to the exhibition were encouraged to try them on and stagger around the gallery like clowns. Visual art is quite a po-faced kind of scene. For me, it's just irresistible to like work with humour in that context, you know, because you know, the way 
artist's dress, the way the curator's dress, it's like borderline absurd, you know, and the affectations, and I, I just think they're so ripe for lampooning. One of my favourite pieces by Bedwyr is Bad Attitude from 2005, in which he parodied the classic 18th century painting, The Bad. Lord of the Rings kind of angle, you know, Mabinocchi and our myths and legends. On one hand, we probably should put them to one side and, like, you know, take a more rational approach to the future, but I just wanted a piece of that, so I just dressed up in that gear. Yeah, some scousers on holiday said, uh, this is like Monty Python, isn't it? As they walked past. And uh, I just thought that's perfect. That is basically living in North Wales, you know. <laughs> that's, why, that's been my life, you know, in a nutshell. I remember seeing your work, Terai Maura, the National Museum in Cardiff in 2016. I'd never seen anything like it. Um, what was the thinking behind that piece? You know, there's some things I guess Wales will never have, and like mega cities uh, is probably one of those things. But I thought, like, what if, with the magic of computer technology, I could imagine a Welsh megacity, you know, in a really unlikely setting, around Cather Idris, more or less. And I populated it with buildings that had been considered controversial at some point in their history, you know, like uh, Barbican Towers and even Zaha Hadid's proposed opera house for Cardiff, which was never built, and I felt like I could bring it home somehow by citing it in my new city. It's been an eye-opening journey for me. Is there a Welsh art tradition? There are Welsh art traditions, but it's more of a snakes and ladders situation, you know? Maybe the way we're exposed to visual culture in Wales was different. You know, we didn't have big museums that we could go to. Certainly North Wales, there wasn't, you know. Some kids growing up in London could say, yeah, we used to go to the National Gallery. Well, I never had that. And um, I think it means that Welsh art history is a bit more eccentric, a bit more gnarly and knobbly, and maybe not so sophisticated. But it's an art history that makes me excited about living and working in North Wales. It feels like an awkward good fit. I do love Bedwyr's description of Welsh art, a tradition he calls eccentric, gnarly and knobbly. And that's what I found, something very individual, different from British art, something that's deep-rooted in Welsh landscape, Welsh culture and the Welsh way of life. It's been a real eye-opener for me on this journey, full of surprises. Some of my own personal highlights have been the monumental wooden Jesse sculpture in Abergavenny. It was a revelation. I discovered a new national hero in Richard Wilson, the father of British landscape art. And in the 20th century, I was dazzled by the colours of James Dixon Innes, who made such an impact in his tragically short life. I still don't think Welsh art is well known enough, either here in Wales or further afield. But I hope this series has given a taste of just some of the riches waiting to be discovered. <laughs>